Good morning, Dog Nation. I am Brandon Adams, and this is Dog Nation Daily, the daily podcast for Georgia Bulldogs fans. Presented today by Pella, window and door of Georgia. We got a fun show for you. Getting a little closer to G-Day. Obviously, big eye towards spring practice on today's program. But off the top here today, Kirby Smart has had a pretty candid discussion with an ESPN reporter. This is not a video or a like a podcast interview. This is like an old school print interview, kind of a Q&A back and forth. But some pretty compelling things from Smart. We'll probably do a couple of this uh, things from this interview over the course of our week. But today, I would describe it as a stern warning for the rest of college football, the rivals and competitors to UGA. If you think Georgia is going to slow down anytime soon, Kirby Smart made it very clear they have no plans in that regard. And we'll kick the show off with that here today. Also, an update on a piece of news involving a future Georgia schedule. We'll cover some of that on the program today there as well. So we're really busy. We're glad to have you with us for it. It's Dog Nation Daily, the daily podcast for Georgia Bulldogs fans, presented by Pella Window and Door of Georgia, and it begins right now. Today's episode of Dog Nation Daily is brought to you by Pella Window and Door of Georgia, viewed to be the best. Presented by DogNation.com, this is Dog Nation Daily, the daily podcast for Georgia Bulldogs fans. Here's your host, Brandon Adams. I want to begin today by looking back in time just a little bit. You know, a few weeks ago, we played a clip from a Kirby Smart interview. It was with the uh, guy that you may see from 24-7 Sports, name's Josh Pate. And in the interview, Kirby Smart kind of talked in, I would say, somewhat candid fashion about where he thinks he is at this point in his coaching career. And we used the clip at the time, and you'll remember this if you're a regular viewer or listener to our show, we used this particular clip at the time to kind of remind Georgia fans of make sure you take the time to appreciate the moment that you're in. Make sure you take the time to understand that the great success that Georgia is currently enjoying isn't going to last forever because nothing lasts forever. And you're in the midst of it right now, and do everything you can to enjoy it. So that means trying to save a little, a little bit of money so you can take the big road trip to go watch the dogs play somewhere, or if you've got the means to to give to the NIL. I know that Georgia's trying to rally folks to participate in this gala they're going to have coming up in a few days. You know, a lot of opportunities to support and spend money, and if you've got the means to do that, there perhaps is never a better time to do that than the era that Georgia's currently in. And when Kirby Smart was with Josh Pate the other day, the guy from 24-7 Sports, he was pretty honest about that, that you know, he's not a young guy anymore. He's also not an old guy necessarily either. He's kind of somewhere in between uh, those two ideas. He's not quite Nick Saban hanging it up, but he's also not quite the fresh-faced rookie that stepped onto the scene in 2016. And I think it's important to hear this again from Kirby Smart because of where I think we need to go today. So let's go back and hear Kirby Smart from 24-7 Sports not all that long ago. I'm in the middle. I definitely don't feel young anymore. Uh, as we hire younger coaches and I'm around players, I, I definitely don't feel young anymore, but I don't feel old either. So I'm calling it uh, neutral 48, sitting in the middle, you know, where uh, it's either, you know, off, keep going from here and, and ascend and keep rising and, and keep loving it, um, or you're looking at the other side of it as uh, I've only been doing it eight, nine years, how much more time do you have? But I certainly think that I'm somewhere in the middle. I think sometimes when you hear something like that, it's a little bit hard to maybe process exactly what that means. But I believe there is sort of a tangible meaning to that notion of Kirby Smart being in the middle of his coaching career. I think there's something to that that's probably a little bit more meaningful than perhaps you realize. Because it actually draws a little bit of a contrast, maybe more so than you think, between Smart and other coaches who've tasted the success, or at least a portion of the success, that Smart tasted in 2021 and 2022 when Georgia won back-to-back national championships. In fact, consider this. Let's go back and look at the recent history of college football national championship coaches. I think perhaps it's maybe a little different than you might think that it would be. Obviously, the guy that's casted the biggest shadow of all over college football in the 21st century is Nick Saban, a guy who's won lots of national championships and put together a pretty significant stretch of longevity there at Alabama. Let's put him aside for the moment because when you think about college football in this period of time, in this era, Saban's probably the thing that you think about the the, the quickest. But let's put him aside and look at other coaches who've tasted national championship success. Let's go back to the end of the BCS era. 
The last national champion from the BCS era in 2013 was Florida State, led by Jimbo Fisher. Think about this. When Fisher wins that title in 2013, I think you'd be led to assume that Fisher was going to be on top of the college football world for a long time to come. He was a newish head coach at the time. Florida State had been a great program, lying dormant for a while, uh, resurrected under Jimbo Fisher. But the truth is, only a few years later, Jimbo was out at Florida State. At the time, most Seminoles fans were kind of glad that was the case. And today, Jimbo Fisher isn't coaching anywhere. The following year, the first year of the college football playoff, Urban Meyer, who had left Florida to spend time with his family, that didn't last very long, ended up going to Ohio State, kind of a good fit for him and his Midwestern roots. And Urban Meyer leads Ohio State to a national championship like right there at the beginning of the college football playoff era. And it sort of felt like this was a perfect match between coach, Midwestern guy, a program like Ohio State that had been hungry for that level of success, and you would have been led to believe that Ohio State was going to be led by Meyer for a long time to come. There would be a, 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 a legacy of dominance put together there at Ohio State because of you know how long tenured you would assume that Urban Meyer might be there. But the truth is, only a few years after that, Urban Meyer was gone. And Urban Meyer's not coaching anywhere now. That, that what you thought may have been more of a long-term proposition actually turned out to be a lot more short-term than you might would have realized. The same thing for Ed Orgeron who led LSU to a national championship in 2019. That's kind of an unlikely story of how he even got to that point. But LSU was one of the best teams anyone had ever seen. And to think that only a a year later, Orgeron would be out as LSU coach, that's almost unimaginable. And yet that's how quickly Orgeron's national championship success turned into a short-term proposition. This is also even somewhat true for a guy like Dabo Sweeney at Clemson, who is still employed by the Tigers, of course, But Clemson, after winning national championships in 2016 and 2018, uh, at this point in time, I would say that Clemson looks to be a long way removed from that national championship college football playoff era they were once playing with. That, That Swinney's coaching career continues, but he is not continuing at the same trajectory he was once on. So the point here is, is that when Kirby Smart says, I'm in the middle and I plan on doing what I have been doing for a long time to come, If Smart really is a man at his word with that statement, we believe that he probably will be. But if he really is a man of his word, he's actually doing something that based on the comparison of other coaches who've won national championships, it's perhaps a little more difficult to do than you somewhat realize because a lot of the guys who have won national championships found that success to be fleeting. So the fact that that Georgia is continuing on this path and that Kirby Smart plans to continue for years to come to do what he has been doing That would allow Smart to kind of stand out from most of the rest of the pack, even from other national championship coaches. So it seems fair to wonder, well, what is the mindset that propels all of this? If Kirby Smart really can put a second half of a coaching career together that mirrors the first, exactly how is that going to be done? Well, in the last few days, Kirby Smart has done what I think is a very candid interview with uh, a guy named Chris Lowe, who's a writer for ESPN.com. Lowe is the guy that was seemingly always profiling Nick Saban. When Nick Saban had something he wanted to get out, uh, Chris Lowe was the reporter he used to get that message out. So perhaps it's somewhat symbolic that now Chris Lowe's interviewing Kirby Smart. Maybe that means that Smart should be viewed as the new face of college football. But either way, one way or another, uh, Kirby Smart, who doesn't do a lot of these things, sometimes even nationally, did sit down for a Q&A with uh, Chris Lowe. And the subject came up of kind of, where Smart sort of views himself now, coming off a couple of national championships and almost winning one this past year. And if you want to know how Kirby Smart plans on making the next phase of his coaching career as successful as the previous phase has been, what he told ESPN, I would say, gives you a good way to do that. And by the way, we're going to probably spend some time talking about this a lot over the course of the next few days. It's a full Q&A on a number of topics, but in particular here, the one quote, let me read this to you. Uh, The question, only five SEC coaches have won national championships at their alma mater, and the 2021 title was the first for Georgia in 41 years. Chris Lowe goes on to ask, as a player, assistant coach, and now a head coach of Georgia, how much does that mean to you? And this is where I think that Kirby gives a very interesting answer. He says, I was brought here to win championships, but the thing I'm proudest of has been the consistency. I look back on year one, Georgia was 8-5 and five in 2016. Kirby says that was a failure and not the standard. 
But every year after that, we've been right there. Nobody else over that span can say they finished in the top seven at the very end for seven straight years. You can't find it, not even at Alabama. We missed the damn playoff three times by being number five or number number six. So those are missed at bats we would have had in this 12-team play. He says, we've been relevant every year, but that first one. But I want, this is the, the, the line that I think doesn't really stand out to a lot of people. Kirby says, I want more than rele- uh, relevance. I want dominance. And we've been more dominant in the last three years. What I don't want are the ebbs and flows or the one-hit wonders that you see out there, like some of the ones I may have just mentioned. I don't want any player to leave Georgia without a championship. And, boy, I think if you're a Georgia fan, I think those words really ring inside your head. Maybe more importantly, those words really ring inside the head of Georgia's rivals. It's competitors to the throne, the programs that want the success that Georgia has enjoyed. Kirby Smart says, I have no plans on going anywhere. Compare that to the most recent national champion, by the way. Michigan finally got over the hump with Jim Harbaugh at the helm, but now you look around and Jim Harbaugh is nowhere to be found. Most of the assistant coaches that Harbaugh had uh, under his you know, control, they've also moved on there as well. Is Michigan still the same program it once was when Jim Harbaugh was leading it to a title? We'll find out, but there's some evidence to suggest that it might not be. But Georgia has no such plans to exit the stage. Kirby Smart says we've won championships, but that's the expectation. We want to continue on in that run of dominance. So much so that every player – that comes through here on over the course of his career at UGA would have a chance to win a championship. How do they plan on doing that? By simply trusting the odds. That if we can stay relevant year after year after year, put ourselves in the conversation and taking advantage of the expanded playoff field so that Georgia can't be unfairly excluded like the way they perhaps were this particular year in 2023. Now, by giving yourself enough at-bats, enough tries, enough years of relevance where you're close enough to make it happen that you can uh, play well enough in the games that matter to give yourself a chance to win, not just the two championships that Georgia's already won, but many more championships in the future after that. Very, very strong words from uh, Kirby Smart and certainly very exciting for UGA fans. And I would say something of a warning to anyone who plans on competing against Georgia in the time to come. Now, let me shift gears to something else here uh, briefly just for a moment. As we talked to Jeff Sintel about on Friday, and I would invite you to go back to the Dog Nation YouTube page, probably the best way to kind of get the archive of this. Uh, Jeff reminding us that this week coming up, very big from a Georgia recruiting standpoint. We already knew about Matt Zollers, the quarterback prospect, who's one of many 2025 quarterbacks Georgia's currently in the uh, mix for here. Uh, Zollers visited Penn State this past weekend and going to be visiting Georgia here coming up this week. And then after that, he's going to be set to make his college decision. But as Jeff also pointed out, we'll show you this on the screen here too, it's not just Zollers who's choosing this week. Zollers on April 4th going to decide between Georgia, Pitt, and Penn State. Those are in-state schools. I'd also say in the case of Mad Zollers, this is, y'all know I'm not a recruiting reporter. I'm just someone who tries to observe this stuff as, uh, as an interested party here. I would watch out for Missouri a little bit on Zollers there as well. I do think that Eli Drinkwitz doing a good job in recruiting. I do think that Missouri could be an interesting factor in this recruitment there, too, in addition to the in-state programs like Pitt and Penn State, the family tied to the Pitt program, and obviously Georgia is, of course, a big factor in all of this, too. But that's going to be an interesting decision for Zollers coming up on April 4th. And then, of course, as Jeff pointed out on Friday, and you can go back and uh, watch the full show, we also have another great uh, one of those YouTube shorts that our, uh, our great friend Cody Chavins, the producer, has put together here of uh, Jeff on Mason Short talking about the fact that he, after originally thinking he may go into the summer, a little more in his commitment announcement, is now targeting this week there as well. So on April 5th, uh, Mason Short, the great offensive line prospect, he's going to choose between Ohio State, Clemson, Georgia, and Kentucky. And stop me if you've heard this before, Georgia and Clemson battling for an offensive lineman here this cycle. It seems like there has been a lot of that over the course of the last few weeks. So keep in mind as we begin the week here on a Monday, a lot of Georgia recruiting stuff set to take shape here this week. Of course, heading towards G-Day and some interesting visitors, no doubt, coming in. And then the summer, which is going to be even busier than that. But keeping your eye on Matt Zollers, keeping your eye on Mason Short, two prospects set to announce their commitment announcement, setting up a very busy week this week for UGA recruiting. 
My name is Brandon Adams, and this is Dog Nation Daily, the daily podcast for Georgia Bulldogs fans, presented today by Pella, window and door of Georgia. Glad to have you with us across all platforms, video, radio, 960 The Ref, podcast, Apple, Spotify, post the show at the world famous dognation.com. Just glad to have all of you as a part of the program here today and glad to have our friends at Pella, window and door of Georgia, making it all possible. This is one of those times in which people sort of view the spring in sort of different ways. When you look out the uh, window and you see it, it looks really pretty. Not everybody, though, loves to be outside a ton this time of year because some of you have allergies and things like that. So, you know, perhaps for you, the best way to enjoy the spring is, if you're watching on video, to look outside beautiful windows, the likes of which the Pella window can provide for you and say, I enjoy the view. I enjoy the sunshine kind of shining in here. But when I want to kind of seal that off, you know, perhaps you have those fancy windows that kind of, you know, bring the shades down or something like that. So you don't have to uh, worry about that much anymore. Either way, the best way to keep the inside feeling nice and fresh, fresh air flowing, keep the pollen on the outside and all that kind of stuff is with the kind of windows and doors that Pella Window and Door of Georgia is famous for. Plus, that air conditioning that you probably spend a lot of money on this time of year, keeping that on the inside where it's supposed to be, that's really important. Keeping the outside of your home looking good, good curb appeal, great way to be a great neighbor, great way to take care of the thing that probably matters to you more so than anything else, which is your own home, and great way to potentially... You know, benefit your resale when it's time to think about doing that there as well. That is what Pella Window and Door of Georgia is all about. Also, great saving opportunities there for you, too, because between now and April 30th, you can get 10% off your project or no payments, no interest for 12 months there as well. So uh, really, really good saving opportunities. Here's what I want you to do. I want you to reach out and have a conversation with one of those Pella experts today. And I want you to tell them the BA from Dog Nation Daily said that they would take good care of you because I know they will. They've been doing that for folks in our audience for a long time, and they can do that for you there as well. So stop by and see them, Experience Center in Duluth. Have them come out to you, and they'll do a no-pressure consultation, really just sort of an informative discussion with you there in your home. You can also give them a call, 678-638-1429. That's 678-638-1429, or PellaofGA.com slash DogNation. One more time on that email, or that web address, PellaofGA.com slash Dog Nation. As I said before, just make sure you tell them the BA from Dog Nation Daily said they'd take good care of you because I know they will because Pella Window and Door of Georgia is viewed to be the best. All right, we are going to do something a little bit different today. So I mentioned this to our video audience a little earlier. Um, I kind of messed it up with John Stinchcomb here this week. John is enjoying some spring break, which he should be doing with his family. He actually reached out to me a few days ago about pre-recording something. You ever have one of those things happen where you look at your phone, you go to text somebody, and you realize they texted you like five days ago and you didn't see it? Well, that kind of happened with John, so we weren't able to do that with John here this week, but we'll catch up with John again when he's back in town next week. Of course, a lot of folks enjoying spring break, and we're glad that you are, and if you're allowing us to still be a part of your spring break experience, we certainly appreciate that too, and we'll talk to John Stinchcomb next week. It's Connor Riley, normally a Tuesday guest, coming up today, pinch hitting for John, but it's actually a great day to have Connor on the show because we're coming off a pretty busy spring practice weekend for Georgia, kind of a closed door scrimmage, but rumors and reports kind of come out of that. So we'll talk to Connor about some of that here coming up in just a little bit. Prior to that, though, I want to go around the doghouse, poured today by our friends at Dr. Pepper. And as we were doing the show on Friday, there was some news coming out that was not unexpected. We'd even, I mean, I'd brought this up a few weeks ago as what I thought was a pretty strong possibility, that Georgia on the heels of getting a 2025 schedule announcement and figuring out kind of who it's playing, that the big non-conference road trip that Georgia was perhaps going to take to uh, Pasadena to play UCLA that year, supposed to play them in back-to-back years, 2025 and 2026, the chances seem to be growing that trip might not happen. Josh Brooks, Georgia Athletic Director, was on 92.9 The Game, Stake Shapiro, our buddy Rusty Manziel. Uh, Drew Butler was on that day there as well. They were in Athens. And uh, Rusty asked Josh about the rumblings that perhaps Georgia and UCLA will not play in Pasadena in 2025. And Josh Brooks gave you the sort of uh, non-committal answer that probably will be taken as a commitment in the negative here. Uh, let me let you hear Josh Brooks on 92.9 The Game here this week. Um, we'll see. You know, obviously with the evolution of uh, the Big Ten schedule and our schedule, okay. um, we've got to make decisions that are best for us, and they've got to make decisions that are best for them. So 
everything's in play. So we'll see. There's some, uh, you know, it's a fluid situation. So fluid situation, but if we're like, you know, less than a, you know two years away from the actual game being played, if Brooks is saying we'll see about it being played, I think you can fairly reasonably assume that it probably won't be played. And, you know, the day that the 2025 schedule came out, we went on video that afternoon, and I was bringing this topic up that day saying, you know, I wonder if there's an appetite to go out to Pasadena here right now because ultimately that's what this really kind of comes down to is road games like this are expensive. And for the next couple of years, just to be completely frank, I don't know how competitive UCLA is going to be. Chip Kelly obviously just left that program to go be offensive coordinator at Ohio State to give you an idea about the gap that exists between the top program in the Big Ten, maybe right now Ohio State, and a team just newly joining the Big Ten like UCLA, you know, this is just not the same level of program. And Deshaun Foster, with all due respect, I don't quite know right now what kind of coach he's going to be. There is a very good chance that UCLA, which has major budget concerns and things like that, there's a very good chance they're just non-competitive for the next couple of years. And so is it really worth it right now to fly all the way across the country to play a football game that may be the same kind of blowout that Georgia could play just by hosting some sort of, you know, sister of the poor type team here at Sanford Stadium. You know, perhaps that's the case. And I do think that if you're Josh Brooks, fan concern here is your ultimate job. That's what you do, right? I mean, it's like Kirby Smart's job is about how do you win football games. Josh Brooks, I would say, is a little bit more along the lines of how do I serve my constituency, the people who kind of, you know, giving us the money that allows us to operate as an athletic department. And I don't hear a lot of hue and cry from Georgia fans of, oh, gosh, we've got to go relive the experience in Pasadena. We got to go. We got to go back to Pasadena again. The fact is, Georgia was just in LA for the national championship two seasons ago. I'm not actually sure how right now how many Georgia fans are dying to go back to Pasadena again, given the fact that it would be a very expensive trip for, um, you know, for what might not be the world's best football game. But in this same interview with 92.9 the other day, Brooks did talk about uh, the 2025 home schedule and the fight that he went through, uh, according to his own telling of it to make sure that Georgia fans did get the kind of home games they've been wanting. And I like this from Josh Brooks. I wanted you to hear this there as well from the 92.9 interview just the other day. Yeah, it's what I wanted, not what I fought for, because I I stood up in the room and I said, guys, if y'all are going to make me go to Austin and Tuscaloosa or or Oxford, those jokers are coming here. I said, I owe it to my fans. You know, you're not going to make us go to those three places. And then there may have been an AD or two that stood up in the room and said, we don't want that. I was like, tough. Good for Josh Brooks there on that fight hard for that. I do think this works out well for Georgia. Now I would still say that the SEC's inability to kind of find unanimous agreement on what the schedule should be long-term is probably a little bit of an issue, but in the short term, what benefits Georgia is to have the kind of big games at home that fans have been craving and frankly get return dates as Josh Brooks says on the big road games uh, that the program is going to play obviously for this upcoming season. So to summarize all of this, I don't know how many Georgia fans right now are all that interested in going to Pasadena. It's not the kind of thing you necessarily turn down, but it's a pretty expensive trip for what might be a fairly, you know, uninteresting football game. But fans, I do believe, are incredibly excited about the chance to see Texas come in here and Alabama come in here and maybe even Ole Miss coming in here uh, again there as well. And so I would say in this particular case, if this is where we're moving towards, you know, the UCLA game not being played, and obviously the excitement building for those big 2025 home games, this is probably moving in a direction that most fans kind of want anyway. And we'll make that around the doghouse here today on Dog Nation Daily. Of course, it's poured by our friends at Dr. Pepper, and obviously a big part of my Easter weekend uh, was Dr. Pepper because anytime I'm getting together with family and friends and just enjoying that time, Dr. Pepper is always a uh, part of that for me, the rich, one-of-a-kind flavor of Dr. Pepper. I'm a Kroger picking some up all the time. We have it stocked here in our studio. It's the kind of thing that you need to keep well stocked wherever you are to make every event more fun, including college football season. We're we're doing all of that. We love the Fansville commercials. We like all of that. But we love the 23 flavors that Dr. Pepper is famous for. It's a pepper thing. Great to have Dr. Pepper as a part of Around the Doghouse here today. And, of course, great to have all of you as a part of our program today there as well. Before we're done, a little bit of an update on our Golden Shoe Bracket Challenge. A little bit of hype building maybe for one of Georgia's rivals in football, and we'll get a chance to make fun of one of Georgia's other rivals because of another sport there as well. So we'll cover all of that ground before we're all said and done. But for now, 
Uh, pinch hitting for John Sinchcomb today, covering all the bases of everything going on around UGA. Let's bring on Connor Riley here today on Dog Nation Daily, presented by Pella Window and Door of Georgia. From Athens and across the SEC or wherever the recruiting trail may lead, here's a DogNation.com insider. Let me bring Connor Riley in on the topic we were just discussing first and foremost, then we'll get to everything else. Connor, you and I actually discussed, and by the way, thank you so much for appearing here on a day other than your own, and obviously belated birthday wishes for you there as well. But you and I were on video together shortly after the 2025 home schedule was announced for Georgia, or the entirety of the 2025 schedule was announced. And we were bringing this up on video that day. I, I told you, said, I wonder if this UCLA ga- game gets played. The fact that Josh Brooks on radio on Friday can't commit to the fact that it will be played. I think most of us are going to assume, well, therefore, it's then not going to be played. I think that most Georgia fans are sort of fine with this. Pasadena is a pretty expensive place to travel to for a game that I don't think is going to be very consequential. I don't believe UCLA is a competitive football team for the next few years, unfortunately, for them. And so if this game doesn't happen, unlike, say, going to Oklahoma in 2023, which I think a lot of Georgia fans did want to do, um, in this particular case, I don't think there'll be a lot of crocodile tears being shed over not you know, spending thousands of dollars to go back and relive the experience in Pasadena from 2017. I think most Georgia fans are probably fine with this. Do you agree with that? Yeah, and I'd mentioned there as well, you know, they were in Los Angeles for the uh, 2023 national championship game against TCU. And so I think that trip as well uh, takes some of the potential sting out of not getting a trip to Los Angeles. I think you're absolutely right. I think with Josh Brooks sort of publicly acknowledging uh, that this game, you know, potentially may or may not be played, I I think sort of indicates maybe where the wind is blowing on this one. And, you know, I don't know how much of this has to do with the fact that UCLA isn't all that great right now. Uh, You know, they could turn around, they could win 10 games this season. I'm not saying they're obviously going to do that, but like they could. And and I still think the success of UCLA doesn't so much change this as the fact that you have that schedule. You're already playing a Georgia Tech team that, mind you, I mean, if you're buying stock, I think you're saying Georgia Tech is probably going to be better in the next three, four years than UCLA is. And so you add that in, you've already got a very competitive schedule. I think that moving forward, we are maybe going to see Georgia start to walk back some of the aggressive scheduling that they've done because of the fact that the SEC is just going to be playing a more difficult schedule on a year-in, year-out basis. And while the you know, Georgia benefits with a home 2025 schedule, uh, they play the toughest road schedule in the country this season. So I think balancing all that out is going to be really interesting in, in terms of what Georgia does going forward because UCLA isn't the only big uh, home and home game Georgia has scheduled in years to come. Clemson is on the schedule. Florida State is. Louisville, other programs as well. And it'll be interesting in seeing just the appetite to keep those games on the schedule with the SEC slate being what it is moving forward. Okay, so there are two things I want to talk about uh, as it relates to this topic, and you kind of touch on one of those. I want to go down this road a little bit further. So we had a big time when it was announced years ago that way into the future, Georgia would be doing a home-and-home with Oklahoma and, you know, home-and-home with, like, Ohio State's on there and Florida State's on there. there. There's all these Texas on there. I'm starting to wonder, Connor, if any of these actually end up getting played. Oklahoma's already been canceled. You know, UCLA that was sort of scheduled prior to this, now that's canceled there as well. Of all of the news related to all of these non-conference series that Georgia stepped up and said, we want to be aggressive with non-conference, you know, not to get too inside baseball, but all that decision-making, my understanding is, was sort of run out of the football office, not the athletic director's office, but the football office. The guy who led the way on that doesn't even work for Georgia anymore. Uh, I I sort of wonder if any of these non-conference series that Georgia announced years ago, I sort of wonder if any of these series end up getting played. What do you think about that? And and that's a very fair point because, look, uh, two of those teams that Georgia has future home-and-home scheduled against, uh, Clemson, Florida State, are suing to get out of the ACC at this point in time. And so you wonder, you know, much like the Texas series, much like the Oklahoma series, do those games just become future SEC games and no longer non-conference home and homes? And obviously we have a long way to go to that. Who knows what that is going to to hold and ultimately look like there. But I think, again, you know, those schedules were designed with a different, you know, college football pla- college football playoff path in, in in mind you know we did not know that there was going to be a 12 team playoff when those games were scheduled 
we still don't know what the college football playoff format's going to look like moving forward. We know these next two seasons will have two teams. It could go to 14 teams, may ultimately end up at 16 teams. So I, I think, again, because of the sport of college football changing so much, in my opinion, since those games were first scheduled, I think that's a very big reason why you may not ultimately end up getting a chance to go to Tallahassee, a place where Georgia hasn't played in a while. Uh, you know, Cle- I haven't played at Clemson since 2013. That you know, we'll see how long that ends up being the case for. So those big home and homes that people were excited for, you know, understandably so. I, I think just sort of reflect a different era of college football, specifically with Georgia, where for a lot of those years. You know, I can think back 2014, you know, that game against Clemson at home in Athens was a huge game. And because of the fact that it wasn't a great SEC state that season because Georgia was playing in the East at the time, uh, that took on an added importance. When you're hosting Texas, when you're hosting Alabama in the same season, those non-conference games, quite frankly, just don't look as good because of the history of the sport and, and how rare, you know, to get to play those teams. And now you're potentially doing that on a more frequent basis there's just less of an appetite for those big non-conference games. And I think it's interesting from a fan standpoint because, and there's not necessarily a right or wrong answer to this. I think it's just, you know, different people have may have different opinions. Do you want larger SEC schedules, for instance, a ninth game where you're seeing the SEC teams more frequently, or would you prefer a little bit more balance of a chance to go play more interesting non-conference series? I think different fans may have different answers. But, Connor, if you ask me, you know, when you look at all the change that's about to take place in college football, some of this is going to be changed for the worse. Some of this may be changed for the better. But one of the concerns that I have is, and this is not, you know, a verified thing. This is just sort of a speculative statement. But I'm a little bit fearful that in the future, kind of like going back to the sort of the days of boxing when I was a little bit younger where HBO fighters didn't fight Showtime fighters, depending on what network you were on, that kind of determined who you fought. I'm a little bit fearful in the future an ESPN team is not going to play a Fox team during the regular season. And if you want a non-conference matchup between a team that, you know, is a part of an expanded Big Ten and a team that's a part of an expanded SEC, I'm a little bit fearful that we might come to a world in which TV drives this stuff so much that you're no longer allowed to even play on somebody else's network for a multitude of reasons. I I can't obviously guarantee that that's what the world is going to be. When I think about potential changes for the worst that could happen for college football, that's one of the concerns that I do have is that eventually TV and media partners may drive this so much that we no longer even have the possibility of playing these kinds of non-conference series because it would just require cooperation between networks that don't want to cooperate. Yeah, I wonder if it sort of maybe becomes what Major League Baseball was like prior to the introduction of inter play and where you have you know the american league and the national league or the espn league and the fox league and unfortunately that just seems to be the way that it's heading uh i think colleges have seen and hitched their wagon to tv networks as a way to to bring in billions of dollars and and that's the right and understanding of doing that but i i think you and i both sit here and agree that the tv money and tv networks in particular have hurt this sport. And, and, you know, I think going forward that this is going to be something that I think only continues to have a massive impact on the sport, on the way it's run, on the way decisions are made. And and so it'll be very interesting moving forward to sort of see how TV contracts, TV networks continue to warp this sport and just sort of what the appetite is for it and what it looks like moving forward. Uh, You know, change, yes, can be uncomfortable. And most some of the times it can be for the better but you know you look at some of the things that college football is doing like the fact that they're debating about going to like either a 12 team or a 14 team playoff after just so recently deciding hey we're actually going to expand again uh you know it, it causes great concern and, and those concerns are only going to continue as i think we move further into the future and in sort of seeing understand that tv is going to be a major revenue driver and that these these schools, these conferences are going to attach themselves to it. Uh, we talked a little bit earlier about the interview that Kirby Smart gave Chris Lowe at ESPN. I thought it was pretty interesting. And I guess my biggest takeaway on this, and I'm sure there'll be plenty of things we'll probably discuss from this during the week. And I know you've written about one of the things that Kirby said there, dognation.com today related to the team on the field right now. But big picture, I don't see Kirby Smart slowing down at all based on in terms of what he told Chris Lowe about his desire to keep Georgia dominant and the fact that he's so proud of the relevance that Georgia's had in every year but one during his time at UGA. And, you know, Connor, the point I tried to make before you came on is 
that may seem self-evidently true, but for a lot of other national championship coaches, that actually proved to be pretty difficult. You know, Jim Harbaugh has gone from Michigan. Ed Orgeron's not coaching at all anywhere. Urban Meyer was out of Ohio State shortly after winning a CFP national title. Jimbo Fisher is not coaching anywhere right now after winning there at, at Florida State in 2013. Uh, you know, right now, Dabo Sweeney is not at a national championship level, although he is still coaching. You know, the idea that Kirby Smart wants to put a second decade of coaching together that matches what he's done in almost this first full decade and, and the fact that he seems so intent on getting that done, if he pulls that off, I think we would say that he probably will. But if he does, it's actually a little bit more remarkable feat than it might seem. Would you agree with that? Yeah. And, and you know, this is one of the things where, you know, in, in parlor conversations with, with Georgia fans, they wonder, you know, how long is Kirby Smart going to coach? How can he keep this up at such a level for so long? I think knowing Kirby Smart and covering him in the way that I have, he's only wired one way and it's not like, you know, he's not going to, oh, I want to go work in TV. Like I'm, I'm satisfied with what I have done. You don't build the Georgia program, the way and the manner in which he has built it during the time in which that he has built it um, to, to not make it this sustainable long-term thing. And, and he's wired and he loves coaching. He said that before, uh, I, you know, there are aspects of this job, obviously he doesn't love dealing with, and that's certainly understandable, but I do think that as we get further and further into this sort of transfer portal NIL era, which we are currently in, I, I think that he, because he's already done so much of the hard legwork where, you know, again, this before prior to 2021, you know, these things weren't really all that big or they weren't on the scale that they are now. And so as they get further and further into it and have a better understanding on a year in year out basis, I do think at a certain point, this job becomes a little bit easier and a little bit more manageable, but it's just hard to deal with that in the middle of all of it right now. But you know, Georgia's as well positioned as any program moving into the 12 team college football playoff era. And, you know, you think with the advantages that they have because of what Kirby Smart has built, they're going to be able to continue to contend for national championships. And so the timing of that where he doesn't have, say, the Dabo downturn that Sweeney has had these past couple of seasons, I think it's going to make it easier to sustain. And thus that's going to keep him around longer and longer. So the time we have left, I want to talk about uh, behind closed doors on Saturday, Georgia has another scrimmage and, uh, or I guess it may be the first scrimmage of the spring. A lot of whispers kind of coming out of this. It seems like as we've expected, you know, Georgia offense continues to do very well. It sounds like, you know, quarterbacks having a pretty good spring there as well. Georgia offensive line having a pretty good spring. What are we hearing out of Georgia spring practice here right now as we'll all get a chance to see this with ourselves there on uh, G day, but thus far, you know, Kirby used the phrase as advertised the other day and talking about Ellis Robinson and KJ Bolden. It seems like the best that I can tell and just talking to people who know people who know people, it seems like there are a handful of Georgia guys. That, some of the guys you would expect to do well are themselves having very good springs here right now. Yeah, I think it's encouraging to hear that Dylan Bell goes out and plays well on Saturday, and you're looking for him to become, I think, a, a number one wide receiver option. It's encouraging that Roderick Robinson seems to be having a strong spring as George is going to need him in this coming season. Uh, you know, obviously Trevor Etienne was having one as well, and and then has the off field arrest. But I, I think, you know, for Georgia, the offense right now is the story. The offensive line, you know, yes, you lose Amarius Mims, you lose Cedric Van Fran. Those are two pillars of your offensive line. But they're so deep and they rotate so well and, and they just have so many guys on that offensive line. It's not all that surprising that this group is positioned to go out and have a strong season. And, you know, there's been some chatter. There have been some media reporters asking uh, about the Joe Moore Award, something that is so far down the line. And I know, you know, doesn't seem all that important. But, you know, look, it's a Georgia offensive line that has been among the best in college football on a yearly basis. And yet they have not won this award. And, and so I, I think, you know, it's something that they acknowledge. But they just realize they want to go out there and be the best offensive line because – I think you think back to that Alabama game, the offensive line as a whole didn't have their best day. And yes, part of that is Amarius Mims going down. But I, in my opinion, the offensive line didn't play great that day. And so using that game as sort of, you know, something that sticks around that motivates you that like, Hey, we got to keep getting bigger and better and stronger. Uh, I, I think has been an encouraging development for this group this spring defensively. And there's been some hand wringing. I know obviously Kirby smart had the comments about the defensive line in his interview with Chris Lowe, 
it, it's important to point out that the middle of this defense is missing some really key pieces. And when I say middle, you, you think up the spine. Malachi Stark's safety position is out with a shoulder injury. Small Munden is out with a foot injury. And then Christian Miller, I, I think a guy a lot of people have high expectations for entering this season is coming back from meniscus surgery. So that spine of the defense right up the middle where it was so strong in 2021, when you had Lewis seen the Kobe Dean and Jordan Davis there, uh, even that next season, Chris Smith, uh, small Munden, uh, Jalen Carter, uh, that spine of the defense is really, really important. And with so many key pieces out right now, it is going to be a more of a wait and see approach with this Georgia defense in terms of what it ultimately looks like in the 2024 season. All right, let me do one final follow-up on that particular point when it relates to the defensive line. And we talked about this one of the days last week, I can't remember, that the seven-round ESPN mock draft that recently came out had nine Georgia players selected, which is one fewer than they had the previous draft and a handful fewer than they had in the 2022 draft. And what I did was you kind of go and look position by position of – well, if Georgia is going to have fewer players drafted, where is that like gap coming in? And it's in the front seven, right? It's, it's not going to be an inside linebacker drafted this year. That's because mostly they're relatively young at that position. Those guys are still in place there, but they're also not expected to have a defensive lineman drafted this year either. Now, some of that's because Stackhouse and Brinson came back to Georgia. They almost certainly would have been drafted had they been in this year's draft. But Connor, it does speak to, you know, for as good as the offensive line seems to be performing based on the whispers that are out there and as optimistic as people are about Carson Beck and what he can do for this Georgia offense, they have just got to get that defensive line playing at as close to a level as this team, you know, was in 2022 and, you know, maybe to a certain extent 2021, although that's obviously a pretty big ask. But, you know, getting that group back towards that national championship level, you know, that's, I would say, as important a task facing Georgia as anything and this year's draft sort of foreshadows that right now it's just not the same level of Georgia defensive line. And finding some way to make that true by the time you get to the games that matter in the 2024 season, I just believe that's just imperative for Georgia right now. Yeah, in my opinion, it's priority number one uh, for the remainder of the offseason is just what we're able to see with this defensive line. And, and you you look at this and you wonder, okay, how, how could it have gotten to this point, you know, you think you finally start seeing first round Georgia defensive linemen go and you think that this should be a yearly thing. I think you look at the 2021 recruiting cycle, that's the COVID recruiting cycle. Uh, it, it was not a great defensive line signing hall. And I think the, the inability to bring guys in on visits, uh, specifically out of state players makes that more difficult uh, because I think you were in that cycle in particular, a little bit more beholden to the talent in your own state that season. And, and so you look at the 2022 recruiting class. These are guys that are going into their third year in the program. Bear Alexander ends up transferring out. Christian Miller working his way back from an injury we mentioned earlier. Michael Williams sort of bouncing around both the defensive line and outside linebacker spot. I don't know if that he's found his best home yet where he can be a most impactful defensive player. And so you have a guy like Tyrion Ingram Dawkins, who you see right there. I, they need him to be healthy. He's been dealing with a foot injury, obviously, this spring, but also much of last season as well there. So you're relying on veterans because, as Kirby Smart has said, and I wrote about this with Joseph Jonah Ajanye this morning, a, a defensive line is not a position where you can come in and play a big, big role right away. You might be able to be a role player, which I think they hope Jonah Ajanye can be, maybe similar to what Trayvon Walker did in his 2019 season. But, but – uh, the Trayvon Walker, who was a game wrecker for Georgia during that 2021 season, was a very different player than who he was as a true freshman. And so uh, you're you're asking a lot of a guy like Jordan Hall, who didn't have a great freshman season. Jamal Jarrett, I would include as well there. They're young players. Uh, you know, bringing back uh, Warren Brinson and Nazir Stackhouse is going to help. Those guys need to continue to get better, uh, and I believe that they will. Uh, it's a deeper defensive line this year, and a big reason why is because Stackhouse and Brinson came back, and you hope that because of their return, because you have more bodies coming in, that you're able to rotate a little bit more, keep guys a little bit fresher, because that was such a big part of Georgia's defensive line success in 2021. But looking ahead, you know, you look at what Kirby Smart said about the position last year and the way that it played out, and then he's already in 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 March of this year saying something similar. Uh, Again, Georgia didn't lose to Alabama because of its defensive line last year. They didn't win, not win a national championship because of its defensive line solely. But that played a factor in yeah. Georgia's team not winning at all last season because, you know, like, yeah, the offense didn't play great um, for stretches of that game. 
But when they needed a stop at the end of that game in the fourth quarter, they couldn't get off the field. And the defensive line plays a, fi- a factor in that. So I definitely think that the defensive line is something to watch. I know the transfer portal opens up uh, April 15th. If there's a defensive lineman that can help Georgia uh, enter the portal, they will absolutely pursue that. But I think this is priority number one moving forward. Connor, it's really good stuff. It's not your normal day to be with us, but you were as good as ever. So we certainly appreciate that. And as I said before, very happy birthday to you as you uh, – Enjoy that, and uh, we'll look forward to speaking to you here on Dog Nation Daily, presented by Palo Endo and Door of Georgia, very soon again as well. Yep, as always, it's a pleasure. Let's take a look around the rest of the league. This is SEC Through. Let me make a final point about something that's come up in the show a couple of times here, which is what Kirby Smart told Chris Lowe, ESPN, about you know the notion of Kirby wants to be dominant when he can, but relevant every year. Let me tell you how that impacts those of us who are fans. This is what we get ready for, right? It comes comes down to the batting average. Think about Tiger Woods and major championships. Think about New England Patriots and Super Bowls. Think about, you know, New York Yankees and World Series. Think about, you know, these great, successful organizations who've had the success. You know, there's really very little in the way of, like, perfection, right? Nobody bats a 1,000. I I know Michael Jordan went six for six and tripped to the NBA Finals. But that's not what Tom Brady's story was. Tom Brady's story was a lot of Super Bowl wins, but some Super Bowl losses, some early playoff exits, sort of everything in between. Tiger Woods kind of the same way. You know, you got the Tiger Slam in 2000, but you've also got this period of, you know, sometimes he's winning, sometimes he's not. And it just becomes about sort of playing the ratio. So what does that mean for Georgia fans? It means we got to gear up both, you know, emotionally and everything else from the standpoint that as we look ahead to the next nine, ten years worth of Kirby Smart here at Georgia, a lot of big wins likely to come Georgia's way. But there'll also be some heartbreaking losses factoring that there, too, just like there was in this SEC championship here this year. That's what relevant when that's what relevant and dominant kind of means, right? It's like when you have a chance to take that championship, reach out and grab it. But putting yourself in the conversation year after year is also going to mean the occasional uh, heartbreaking loss there as well. And that's just kind of what sports is all about. And that is what it seems like Georgia is sort of set up to be here in the years to come. Now, in the days to come, here's what we're set up for. That's a Dog Nation cruise on board Allure of the Seas. And I am so ready to put Allure of the Seas on display for the folks that are going to be on this Dog Nation cruise. Because when you got hundreds of people on board, you have a lot of different stories. You have a good number of people who've been with us on a previous Dog Nation cruise. And you've got some people who perhaps are cruising for the very first time. And the fact their first cruise or their first ever cruise on an Oasis-class ship gives them a chance to experience the best of what Allure has to offer. I'm just so excited about this. And I was so happy that for our Dog Nation cruise here this year, we were able to really kind of upgrade in some respects and uh, and provide a ship bigger and in many cases better than we've been able to be on before. And I just think it's really fun that, that Royal Caribbean is doing this because for a long time, the Oasis-class ships, the largest cruise ships at sea, which they were for a good long time, we're kind of exclusively reserved like a seven-night sailing. And what Royal Caribbean has said, especially out of Port Canaveral, we sail out of, so many families like the Port Canaveral destination, so many families like the three- and four-night itinerary. So how about make the Oasis-class ships, like Allure of the Seas, available for one of those shorter itineraries? I just think that's a great thing, and it's one of the fun things that Royal Caribbean's doing right now. So if you missed out on your chance to be on the Dog Nation cruise with us, reach out to Jessica Slater. She's a travel agent specially selected for us by Royal Caribbean, and she can help you with your own cruise vacation needs. You can give her a call, 770-718-9147. That's 770-718-9147. You can email her, jslater at dreamvacations.com, and you can tell her, B.A.'s been talking about Allure of the Seas. I could not be on the Dog Nation cruise, but I want my own Royal Caribbean cruise vacation experience, and Jessica can help you out with all of that. All right. Let's talk some basketball here for a moment. Now, before we're done, we'll give you an update on our Golden Shoe Bracket Contest, although the uh, top dog in that remains unchanged. But we will give you a little bit more. Some people were saying they wanted to see a little bit more of like the top 10 or whatever. So I've made some room on the graphic to hopefully be able to do that. We'll do that here in a little bit. But as far as the SEC teams, good news for one, not quite so good news for the other. We said on Friday, we're not proud of this. And you know, ultimately, I'd like to be a good man. I'd, li- I'd like to be thought of as a good man in life. That's important for me. But there are also moments which I just sort of have to be honest about what I actually am, which is at times a little bit petty, at times willing to be a hater. And we said we're going to be hating. Uh, we don't want Alabama or Tennessee to make the Final Four. 
did not get our wish when it comes to Crimson Tide. They do advance. Tennessee, though, going home. So Tennessee's streak of not winning the big one, winning nothing of consequence, it continues after a loss to Purdue on Sunday. Now, I will at least give Tennessee a little bit of credit for this. I won't say credit, but I'll, I'll join them in this. One of the things that I would kind of knock basketball on, I'm someone who's grown up a big basketball fan. One of the things I would knock basketball on a little bit is that it is the sport I, th- I would say most impacted by officiating. And I definitely feel like the way that Zach Eady was being officiated on Sunday, you know, a lot of ticky tack foul calls, you know, lot, you know, big imbalance in the, in the total number of calls there. I do think that favored Purdue. I just, you know, I don't think it was cheating or like, you know, I don't think the officials were out to get Tennessee or anything like that. I just think that it was a game called pretty tightly as it related to the best player on the floor, or at least the best player for Purdue in Eady. And I do think that had an impact. And I do know for Tennessee fans, it's pretty frustrating because, you know, you bring in the transfer connect, you know, you have the success all year long that you had, you know, this is supposed to be your year to break through and do something you haven't done before. What they have to settle for is, well, it's still probably the best Tennessee basketball season of all time. And it is right. Tennessee's some of y'all know better than I do. Probably Tennessee's never really had a men's basketball season as successful as this, but it's not the final four they wanted. And it kind of continues, as we said before, the streak of early eliminations in baseball, you know, football number one in November, nowhere to be found in December. You know, a lot of Tennessee seasons in a lot of different sports you sort of come up short, and uh, the basketball team now added to that category. On the Alabama side, just the one thing I'll say about them real quick is what's amazing here is, A, I think that Nate Oates now joins the category of top flight coaches in the sport. We would say that. But also, it's a situation where they had such a transformation of their roster after losing all the players from a year ago in the transfer portal this past year. And some of that's probably NIL, but some of that just seems like good scouting. Some of that just seems like really identifying players who could come in and help. Uh, so, you know, as much as it pains me to admit, pretty impressive showing from Alabama basketball there on that. I, I saw an interesting story at on3.com as it relates to Auburn and one of their guys, Andy Staples, kind of touting the idea that Auburn could be an improved offense here in 2024. And I do think it sets up, whether you agree with Staples' point on this or not, I I do think it sets up for Auburn to probably be one of the most interesting teams in the SEC for the upcoming season. Because we talk a lot about, you know, who's got what schedule and the changeover of divisions. And in some cases, teams are playing far more difficult schedules than they've played before. But there are some teams, and, you know, Auburn historically has kind of played one of the toughest schedules in the country you can make a case that for this upcoming season, that's scheduled not nearly as tough as we've seen Auburn play in the past. For instance, you got non-conference games, Alabama A&M, Cal, uh, New Mexico. You know, the SEC games include Oklahoma. That's probably a little bit of a break, not getting Texas. Uh, they are at Missouri. That's a game in which they'll probably be a fairly sizable underdog. They're at Kentucky. That's certainly not a guarantee. They do get Vanderbilt, though. You know, Texas A&M is probably a little bit of a toss-up. And then to end the season at Alabama, uh, which, you know, who knows what Alabama is by that point in time, it's probably a little bit more of a manageable schedule than Auburn's had in the past. So there's obviously an opportunity for improvement. The thing that Staples points out at On3.com is the presence of a five-star receiver like Cam Coleman, which obviously is a big win for the Auburn coaching staff to keep him in the class. But the question we would ask is, and this is us not trying to be haters, this is honestly trying to come up with a, reasonable answer what is the situation at quarterback and how is it that Auburn is going to turn back to Peyton Thorne again here this year after the lackluster season that Thorne had last season and maybe because Hugh Freeze is such a quarterback whisperer and this Auburn offense led by Hugh Freeze you know really does have the same kind of components in place that previous you know Freeze teams have had maybe Thorne has a better year but the fact that Auburn did not make the upgrade at quarterback during the off season is pretty surprising. Coleman probably really is a, you know, a prospect worth paying attention to, but if there's no one to, de- to deliver in the football, how much offensive improvement can Auburn truly show schedule a little easier? The, the, the star potential at wide receivers, obvious, but the quarterback situation just does not seem to be changing. So uh, kind of an intriguing season coming up for Auburn. I'll give you one more thing here real quick. Dennis Dodd had a piece at CBSSports.com the other day. The NFL has outlawed what they're calling the hip drop tackle, where you wrap up around the hip and kind of roll as you uh, make the tackle. For now, college football does not have any kind of plans to uh, to ban that, which 
Listen, I, I guess I'm happy to hear that. A, as much separation we can get between the NFL and college football is probably a good thing. And while I certainly want football players to be as safe as they can possibly be, you know, I don't think you can completely legislate danger out of the game. I just don't. And I don't say that flippantly, but I do say that honestly. And so I, I think that in the name of player safety, you know, we've created a job in which the uh, defensive player almost has no way, no where he can strike an offensive player and bring him down without being at risk of penalty. And frankly, these officials aren't good enough to make more judgment calls. And some of the stuff you see, like roughing the pass in the NFL, it is laughable. And I don't say that as like, you know, some meathead that doesn't, you know, care about, you know, player safety or the, the value of a star quarterback and what happens when he's taken away. I have, you know, full understanding of all of that. I'm just saying that the officials aren't good enough to make accurate judgments about what is and what isn't a correct tackle. And so making that job more difficult is obviously a fool's errand. And in addition to that, I would say that when you look at, you know, the way in which football is already played, the defense has a hard enough job as it is. Anything we can do to kind of bring a little bit more balance to the sports probably a good thing. And so if college football does resist this, I'd say that's probably a good thing there as well. And with that, we'll call it cruising around the SEC, courtesy of Royal Caribbean. A quick note here before we do our uh, golden shoe. Georgia baseball, you know, we said going into the weekend, it'd be kind of nice to see them win a game on Friday or Saturday, have a chance to win the series on Sunday. That's basically the way that it worked out. Blowout win on Friday. Lost the next two on the road at one of the best teams in the SEC. I think you can make a case the Diamond Dogs probably did their job this weekend, run differential-wise. I believe they walked out with the advantage. That doesn't necessarily matter, but it is a thing that is true. They were not ranked in the most recent D1 Top 25 that came out, which is probably the Top 25 the NCAA put, plays the most, pays the most attention to. But, um, but you know, you got a road series coming up against Mississippi State, a home series G-Day weekend against Missouri. You know, winning one of three in Tennessee, that's probably probably about okay for the Diamond Dogs here this week. And, of course, basketball tomorrow in Indy. We'll talk about that then. Speaking of basketball, how about our Golden Shoe Bracket Update? Shanna Jarrett stays on top here. She has been red hot throughout the entirety of all of this, and she's got 82 points. But nipping in her heels right now, Rodney Wooten is second, but he has Kentucky winning it all, so he's not helped by that. You've got Stephen England just three points behind right now. And Stephen and Shanna both have Purdue winning, so he's still alive. William Perry, who's our buddy from the Dog Nation Cruise and also a good friend of Shanna's there too, he's at 77 points right now, but he's got Houston winning it all. Then you get to Scott Moody at 76. He's got Purdue. Bill Wolf is next. And then you've got four guys, Paul Gagnon, Randall Hall, Cam Cochran, Nick, is it Shyman? I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. They've all got UConn winning, so I would say that they are behind now. But at least mathematically, you've got to think still alive because of their champ. Uh, UConn obviously looking very good here right now. So that's our Golden Shoe Bracket Contest update. Shanna's still on top, and she has been for virtually the entirety of the tournament. So good job picking games for her. Today is also April 1st, which means April Fool's Day. And speaking of fools, no greater collection of fools than our friends down in Florida. It's been 1,241 days since the lousy, stinking Gators have beaten the Georgia Bulldogs. That is our Gator Hater Updater. We'll see all of you tomorrow. Dog Nation Daily, presented by Pella, window and door of Georgia. And on video. Time now for the R.S. Andrews cool down. R.S. Andrews is the one you turn to for your air conditioning, heating, plumbing, electric needs. They show up on time. They do the work that's promised, the price that's promised. You can trust all of that today. We are going to do a couple of laps around the comment section, then we're going to get off the air for a couple of reasons. A, uh, my kids are at home today. I'm going to go see them for a little bit. It's also, for whatever reason, the air conditioning is not on in our studio today. It's about 1,000 degrees in here today, and it's kind of only in our studio and our control room. I don't really quite know, that, quite know why that is. But nonetheless, that's the case. So it's a little hot in here right now, so we're not staying in here forever today. So just go ahead and know that. Um, DT on the tackle rule being, as he calls it, basically America becoming too soft. I guess there's some of that maybe, you know, I, I, I what I really think is going on with like the, the hip drop tackle thing. I, I think it's kind of a first cousin to that. There are probably some examples where, you know, America's just sort of gotten soft and sort of views, you know, football as like toxic masculinity or something like that. There's probably some of that going on. But I really think the first cousin to that is more along the lines of there is some way to sort of 
perfect the game and that if enough bureaucrats sitting around a boardroom can think of enough complicated rules, they can sort of legislate the game to be something that it isn't. And so I think that's really more what this is. It's, it's, um, it's sort of a level of bureaucracy that trusts itself too much to be able to perfect a system. Um, I, I, think it's, I think that's probably more of what's going on there. Baruch Dog says that he would rather Tennessee make the Final Four than Alabama. He says, we are in recruiting battles for a few players with Alabama, would like us to win some of those. Making the Final Four seems like, Mike's, it, seems like it makes Mike White's job tougher to sell. Yeah, I mean, there's no doubt that, I mean, all, I mean, all of that's tough to sell. I mean, all of that's tough to sell. I mean, all of these sort of border state basketball teams seem like they've got a lot going on. You know, uh, Bruce Pearl has made a living recruiting here in the state of Georgia. Uh, obviously, Tennessee's got a lot to sell. Pearl was doing that in the Atlanta area when he was up there. Now, Alabama's got, you know, this going on there as well. Nate Oates looks like a good coach. Plus, as I said before, like, when you look at some of the transfer players that have just played so well for Alabama this year, a year after, you know, losing what they lost off last year's team, I mean, some of that's also just good scouting. Uh, like the one guy that t- took over some of these tournament games, I mean, that just seems like it was good scouting. And I would say that Tennessee bringing in Dalton Connect, for example, of that too. Um, so, yeah, I mean, it, it, look, this works to Georgia's advantage in football and it works against Georgia when it comes to a sport like basketball. When you've got it, when you've got it really humming as a program, there's a certain compound interest that you benefit from. And when the opposite is true, you also feels like you can kind of never quite catch up. So there are a lot of programs that look at Georgian football and say, how could we ever catch up to that? And when Georgia kind of is on the wrong side of that, when a sport like basketball, you're left to, to kind of wonder some of the same things of how could you ever catch up with some of these programs that seem to have such a big head start against you. Alan Hampton says, what are the chances of Kirby setting the all-time NCAA win record? The playoffs should increase his chances. Is that Eddie Robinson who has that now? Isn't it 300-something games? Am I wrong about this? Does Eddie Robinson have that? Um, it's it, it's it's a huge total, though, right? Um, huge total, I think. Um, Lysol operator says, in ILM portal, you spend enough and you'll catch up. But here's the problem, though. Um, NIL spending typically tracks pretty well with overall fan enthusiasm and optimism. And, I mean, unless you just kind of ran into, like, like, let's say that Ant-Man, and he's not going to do this, but let's say Ant-Man, Anthony Edwards, who's incredibly rich, was like, I really want George to be good at basketball, so therefore I'm going to, personally see to this happens. Like if you've got like one really aggressive, in some cases, ego driven benefactor, then maybe you can do that. But it's hard to convince a lot of Georgia boosters to give a whole lot of money to basketball NIL because the thing they're afraid of is what if I give this money and there's just no change whatsoever? That's why it's easier to raise football NIL is because you can give the money over with a reasonable assumption that the money will be put to good use. I mean, you can give $100,000 to Georgia basketball, and I, I'm not picking on Georgia basketball. I'm just talking about the reality of the situation. A, that may not be enough money to, to sway a top player anyway. And B, who's to say that it even bears fruit, right? I mean, uh, it's just tricky. Johnny Surf Dog brings up a really good point. Ironic that our air conditioning is out at a time in which R.S. Andrews is obviously our, our R.S. Andrews cool-down sponsor. We actually, Johnny, this is a great point. This is why I like you. We actually need R.S. Andrews to come in and get our air conditioning running. It's a really good point. It's a really good point. Uh, how about this? 502 Dog says, can't wait for G-Day. I'll be back in Athens for the first time since 2021 Arkansas. Hopefully catch Diamond Dogs game. Uh, yeah, so as, as 502 says, first of all, I'm glad you're getting a chance to come back. Uh, Diamond Dogs that day, I believe, play at 3.30. G-Day's typically only about two hours. So you can uh, go and watch the entirety of the football game and essentially walk over to Foley Field, and you should get there in time. Uh, Jay Scheib says it's 65 outside. I should open a window. Listen, Jay, this is a professional outfit. This is a professional studio. We have no windows in the studio. We have no windows here. Uh, Alan Hampton says it's Joe Paterno who holds the record at 409 wins. 
409 wins like two careers. I mean, Vince Dooley is one of the greatest coaches of all time. He won 201 games. I think that Paterno won twice that. It's insane. Insane. Let's see what else. DMAR 42 on the subject of participation trophies. Now, I will say this. I'm not going to bore you with my theory on this. But I feel like that one of the most unfairly maligned things in all of American life are participation trophies. I'm actually very pro-participation trophies. And um, I know that goes against, like, conventional wisdom a little bit. But if you really look at, like, I mean, <laughs> I'm not going to get into my thing on this. But if you really look at what, like, is causing trouble for a lot of young people right now, it's sort of an absence of participation, you know, um, that I, I do think participation is something that ought to be celebrated. So I am not anti-participation trophies, which may surprise you a little bit because it just sort of feels like, you know, participation trophies are a fairly easy thing to rail on, but I'm actually very pro participation trophy because I am pro celebrating participation. Um, uh, Frank Patterson says, speaking of our schedule, would you still want to play Clemson and, and uh, Sloopy in the same year in 2030? I'd be okay with it. And I, I think there are some fans who may say, I almost feel like the air conditioning is maybe kicking on here a little bit, but um. I feel like some fans may say, give me a little bit more balance with a few interesting non-conference games to kind of be mixed into the SEC schedule. I think some fans would really like that. I have a sneaking suspicion that home and home against Ohio State for Georgia, not going to happen. I have a sneaking suspicion that won't occur. I do. Um, Let's see what else. Uh, Lysaw also says, uh, I don't know if Kirby coaches long enough to get to 300, 400 win area. Uh, He says, but his win rate titles and his first time head coach at his job, it'll be hard for anyone to catch him with the contact. Yeah, so I agree. I don't think there's any way that Kirby Smart, you know, hangs around long enough to even win like 300 something games. I just don't think that's just a long, long time. Something tells me that might not be in the offering here. But in terms of judging it by like championships and things like that, you know, whether it's like the record or just like a really phenomenal total, that may be the best way to measure Kirby's dominance, I would say. Uh, Paul Moon says he's just enjoying the ride while it lasts, which I think is a wise thing to do. Um, uh, Let's see what else. Um, let me go back over to Facebook. Let me go to Facebook here for a moment. See how folks are doing over there. And see what is going on here on this April 1st. Y'all keep your head on a swivel. I told some of our video people before uh, that were watching for our, what do you call it, like a first and 15, that we've never done a um, April Fool's joke here. If we ever did one, I wanted to do a big one, like really do something big. Uh, and we just don't ever really do that. So if we ever do one, we'll do one really, really big. Uh, but if it's not big, I kind of don't want to do it. But somebody somewhere is going to do one. So y'all keep your head on a swivel. Uh, keep your head on a swivel for sure. Uh, Miriam Corbin says that cell phones, her participation in sports, in some respects that might be the case. Um. William Camacho says, if Kirby continues to coach for another 15 years, he'll break the record of 422 wins. But mathematically, though, I mean, he's at, what, 90 wins in, is it eight years and 90 wins? So, like, mathematically, he'd have to win almost every, I mean, I'm not very smart. So, yeah, y'all don't get me doing math in my head. But he'd have to win, like, every game, which maybe you're saying that's what he'll do. But uh, that's a lot. But now Marshall Fleming says that Kirby, has, and this is what Lysol also brought up there too, which is that you benefit from the longer seasons, which is in some respect true. Um, 
Joe Brammer mentioning uh, Eddie Robinson's – like how many games did Eddie Robinson win? Uh, I feel like that's probably something I should know. Uh, April uh, Van Giesen says that Google says 408 for Robinson. Interestingly, articles listing coaches with the most wins don't include Robinson. Yeah, so, you know, that kind of gets into, like, what games count, what games don't. There was also some of this for um, – Bobby Bowden's all-time record. You know, for a while, Bowden and Paterno were battling each other, and some of Bowden's wins came. So, some of y'all have to help me with this. It's the school now known as Samford that was called something different at the time. Am I right about this? Uh, that's where some of Bowden's wins came from, and there was some debate about whether or not those games should count on the record. Joe Brammer also says, judge it by percentage of wins compared to losses. If you want a more accurate example, that might be it. Now, um, uh, what I have also said is, is that if you want to be the most ambitious about Kirby Smart, like 400-something wins, is prob- that's almost like a Cy Young type stat. That's, that's a crazy stat to even process. To me, when we, we've done shows like this in the past, the most ambitious thing you could say about Kirby Smart is, is that instead of being the Nick Saban of this generation, I mean, there's a chance he could be the John Wooden of college football. You know, Wooden won, what, like 10 titles at UCLA? You know, could Kirby win 10 titles at Georgia? If you want to be just, like, obnoxiously, uh, uh, you know, ambitious about Kirby Smart's legacy, that's something you might say. Joe Brammer also agreeing with me about um, uh, celebrating participation because the the the, uh, the participation rate, especially in football, going down. Look, here's the one thing I can tell you in, in working with a lot of kids is that sports are kind of hard. And um, it's easy to want to give up something when it's hard. And – like making it harder than it needs to be doesn't make that any easier. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, I just think participation ought to be celebrated. That doesn't mean we don't keep score, things like that. Like, it's not what I'm saying. But, I mean, like, take baseball, for instance. Baseball's a hard sport, right? You know, ball gets hit to you, you either catch it or you don't. You get to play, you either make contact or you don't. And, you know, people have this assumption that participation trophies are about making everybody feel like a winner. I can promise you, uh, there is not an overabundance of kids feeling too much like a winner. I can promise you. I, I, I can promise you that there is not. Having seen all kinds of youth sports and all kinds of situations, there is not an overabundance of kids deluding themselves into thinking they are winners more so than they actually are. I can promise you that doesn't occur. There are a lot of kids who sort of feel like, I don't, I don't really know if I'm good enough at this to keep doing it. And if you can prevent some of that from happening, you've probably done the right thing. Um, uh, Matt Rukavina says, if we can have Kirby for 25 years, I would consider ourselves immensely lucky. I'd say so. It's not an impossibility to me that he could stick around for 25 years, but I would say that's a pretty ambitious length of time. I, I, and that's also, ironically, the exact same number of years that Vince Dooley gave Georgia. I would say that's pretty ambitious. Um, but but not impossible either. Back at dognation.com for a moment. Okay, see, some of y'all are great. SEM dog over here. Yeah, so I was right. Samford was once known as Howard College, and Bowden won 31 games there. And so those games being added to his total when he and Joe Paterno were jockeying to see who could be the winningest coach of all time, that was pretty controversial there for a little while. Um, uh, let's see what else. Yeah, PDT on the subject of uh, participation trophies giving players and, and young athletes false hope. I can promise you there is not an overabundance of false hope. I can promise you there's not. I would say there is an overabundance of players who feel like it's not even worth trying. I would say, I, I, I would say there's... If there's too much of anything, it's not, it's not 
problematically high self-esteem. That what's actually going on in with with young people is not not everybody, but I would say a higher percentage than is healthy of uh, of young people who feel like they are so far from success that it's not even worth trying. But if you really look at what's going on in life, you'll see more of that than the other. Um, let us go back to YouTube here for a moment. Uh, also, the, this will be my final point on this, is that kids actually have a very well-developed understanding of hierarchy. Kids understand that very well. Like, I used to be, a, you know, spend a lot of time around classrooms, things like that. I mean, you talk to a school-age kid, they'll tell you who the smartest kid in the class is, who the second smartest kid is, the third smartest kid, the fourth smartest kid, like, like at least in their perception of this. Kids have a fairly well-developed understanding of hierarchy. They do. They do. This is why when it comes to, like, you know, NIL ruining locker room culture and things like that, most of the sort of young college athletes who were once children, they already get hierarchy. They know what the quarterback gets compared to what the inside linebacker gets. They already sort of understand hierarchies pretty well. You know, kids don't have an undeveloped sense when it comes to, to, to hierarchical, hierarchical rankings. Um, all right, a couple more we're going to go. Uh, Spencer Clark reliving the Brock Bowers game against Auburn in 2023. Yeah, one of the all-time performances, man. By the end of that game, when he's just catching ball after ball after ball, you rarely, especially the SEC level, you rarely see one player take over a game to the extent to which Bowers took that game over. He really, uh, really put the team on his back. He really did. Um, uh, Frank Patterson says, any word on how Arian Smith has looked at practice? Some of the buzz coming off this most recent scrimmage, I guess, for Arian is pretty good. So we'll see if that holds up. But it seems like Arian's generated some uh, decent buzz here as of late. Um, and, you know, I, I would say I take it as a positive sign that when media has seen some of those practices, he was kind of seen working up front near the beginning of the drills, which usually sort of a respect of leadership and and kind of position there, not always a guarantee of a starting spot, but some of what media saw show him kind of getting the deference that a veteran player would get, and some of the buzz from this past weekend was pretty positive. Uh, Brandon Griffin, thank you for the kind words. He says, a cup of coffee, five bucks, breakfast burrito, ten bucks, but waking up to BA is priceless. I appreciate that. Uh, thank you so much. Um, let us see what else. Uh, Frank Patterson on the subject, as he calls it, Athensburg, meaning Pittsburgh, that Amarius Mims could go there. Yeah, it seems like you hear some chatter as of that. And I do like the fact that it seems like right now Marius Mims has been sort of consensus, kind of a consensus first-round pick. I, I enjoy that. Uh, let's see what else. Uh, Paul Moon says, I'm certain that Bowers, SVP, uh, uh, KL3, Lad, Mims, they all received participation gr trophies growing up, but it didn't stop them from becoming incredible players. That's exactly right. Um, that is exactly right. All right, let me go back around the other comment section where we're going to get ready to go. Oh, so how about this? Randy Hall is in the top ten. That's Randall Keith Hall. That's him. There you go. So uh, Randy giving you his uh, full name there. That's awesome. Um, Randy also wondering if we'll have a special broadcast for some recruit announcements. You never know. On stuff like this, it typically depends on how those announcements go. Uh, but, but but you know, sometimes anyway. Would we do Mason Short Live? I don't know. That's a good question. That's a good question. Uh, it's worth considering anyway. All right, let me go back over to Facebook one more time, and we're going to get ready to go after this. Uh, William Camacho checking out. William, we're glad you're here. Joe Brammer says that Bowers' 2023 Auburn game was one of the most incredible performances in UG football history. For a single game, it really probably was. You know, it won't be remembered that way necessarily, but in, in terms of the overall performance, I think you're about right on that. I think you're about right on that. Um, all right, we're going to go for now, y'all. Uh, good stuff. Y'all have a great day. Check out R.S. Andrews online. If you do, as uh, uh, Johnny said a moment ago, 
your air conditioning where you are can be working a lot better than ours is right now. And I, I may get on the phone myself and call Dari and ask him if he can come over here and get this air conditioning working better for us. If, it, if it's not cooler and more comfortable tomorrow, that's exactly what we will do. So y'all check it out, R.S. Andrews online, rsandrews.com, for your air conditioning, heating, plumbing, electric needs. They show up on time. They do the work that's promised, the price promised. You can trust them on all of that. Y'all have a great day. We'll see you back here tomorrow. R.S. Andrews, cool down when it's done. Palo window and door of Georgia before that. We'll talk to you then, everybody.